Michael Coates with Pipistrel. We're sitting in front of the newest airplane in your line, the Alpha Trainer. Tell us a little bit about this airplane and, and how it's being received by the people here at Oshkosh. The reception has been fantastic. Um, we've sold now at, directly at this show as of Wednesday uh, five aircraft. Um, three of those have been Alpha Trainers, the other two have been Virus SWs in the experimental category, so the go-fast aircraft. But the Alpha has been the highlight of the show. It's the one that everyone wanted to see because it's a very well-priced aircraft. A lot of people thought it would be you know, cheap and nasty sort of thing, but it's really impressed a lot of people. The airplane starts at around $83,000. How did they get this airplane down under that $100,000 benchmark? They've really started doing it like the car industry. Pipistrel looks at organisations like Toyota, all of their parts, recording and controllers based on the Toyota system, which they actually paid Toyota for, and they do the same thing with production line. Other aircraft are built one at a time in the Pipistrel factory, but with the new factory in Italy, they decided to production line everything, order 12 months ahead of time for things like instrumentation, composites, and by doing forward orders, with set delivery dates, they can really get the prices as lean as possible from the different suppliers and all of those reductions in price have gone into reducing the price of this aircraft from 105000 or, or thereabouts, we've got it down to under 85000 How are pilots finding the airplane? What are they telling you about how it flies? Everybody so far that's had previous exposure to Pipistrel aircraft are saying it's the best handling of all of the aircraft. It's not the best performance because there's others with 100 horsepower and in-flight adjustable propellers, but its overall handling is just superb. Everything is completely harmonised and well balanced. We've done a lot of things for the training market like beefed up the undercarriage, the nose wheel has been strengthened and the angle has been brought back closer so that increases the strength as well. Visibility is improved out of the front. We've put in a different cowling and radiator system so the aircraft can sit on the ground for extended periods of time while an instructor is saying okay this is what we do we're going to taxi out the plane can sit there without overheating so there's a lot of considerations and extras you know like moving the fuel tank to the rear of the aircraft so it's easily fillable um, rather than up on top of the wings so that eliminates people climbing up on ladders Pipistrel also engineered the fuel tank to be a completely autonomous part of the aircraft. It doesn't share any of the fuselage structure. It mounts in several locations and in the event of an accident, the fuel tank is designed to maintain its integrity and the fuel tank mounts will tear away. So the fuel tank will remain as one unit inside a crumpled fuselage. They've really done their homework on that. And the design of the fuel tank is not just a square or a cylinder. It's got multiple and complex shapes, which you can only do with composites, to maintain ultimate strength from impact in, in just about every direction. So we've taken in all the suggestions we've had for the last 10 years from flying schools using pipistrels and tried to incorporate everything into just one product. Avidyne is the brand of choice for pilots who want innovative, easy to use avionics. And the new IFD 540 and 440 FMS GPS Navcoms set a new standard for ease of use and simplicity. As plug and play replacements for legacy 530 and 430 series navigators, the hybrid touch user interface of the IFD 540 and IFD 440 makes it much easier to access the information you want while reducing head down time and making flying more enjoyable. Now you have a choice, and the choice is easy Avidyne. When I was looking at the airplane yesterday, I noticed that it was flaperons as opposed to separate ailerons and flaps. How are students working with the flaperon configuration? Does that make a difference in their flight training? The reason they have flaperons is, like most gliders, only have flaperons is to reduce drag. Having a join between the aileron and the flap creates extra drag. These aircraft are designed for ultimate efficiency and ease of use. It does give you very, very good control. In crosswinds, like of 20 knots or so, you would only use one stage of flap instead of two but in every other instance, the flaperons are great. What do you see as the future of this airplane? Do you see these in half the flight schools in the country or do you see them in private individuals' hands or some combination of both? Well, our goal for the design of the aircraft was purely flying schools. It doesn't have a huge fuel capacity, 15 gallons, which is enough for four hours and 30 minutes reserve at full cruise of 108 knots. We designed it for a training environment where they're mainly just sticking close to the airport, doing circuits, but more than half our sales so far have been to private individuals who have realistically come to us and said, if I take off at eight and I run out of fuel at lunchtime, that's great because I want to land after four hours and have something to eat at lunchtime, visit the bathroom, and then at one o'clock I can take off again and go till five and that's my full day, I've done eight hours and I'm going to sleep well that night. So we 
we know now that we don't need to build planes with 12 hours endurance because while the adventurers that are buying our planes are using that to go around the globe, the average pilot is only flying two or three hours at a time and the benefit here is we can keep the cost down and all their savings is passed on to, uh, on to fuel and they can fly the aircraft whenever they want because they haven't paid that much for it. So they can bring that $100 hamburger down to a $50 hamburger? Well these are very economical, we're using the Rotax 80 horsepower mm -hmm. and we're finding in circuit about just over 2 gallons an hour in circuit and around 3 gallons an hour in cruise 3.2 at 108 knots. Welcome to the Aero News Network, the aviation world's most comprehensive news and information resource. Real-time 24-7 online audio and video programming, where aviation has been getting updated for over a decade. Distributing over 11,000 stories, features, audio and video programs every year. Only ANN covers aviation and aerospace with this much depth, insight and expertise. Check us out on the web at aero-news.net. What kind of instrumentation do you have on board? We've basically had three versions before we actually issued the first plane to a customer. We decided originally that we wanted to go back to basics, analog gauges, because most of the people learning are not 30 years old. They're, they're people that have wanted to fly all their life and they can do it now, they're retired. So most of our customers and people that were being trained were sort of 60 and 70. So we thought, let's go for analog gauges. And uh, that was okay during the evaluation period. Then we looked at OK, let's go for a dyne-on panel or something like that. And then we got feedback that people didn't like that because it was, it was too new for some of the pilots. So we ended up uh, going with another Slovenian company, which is where the Pippis rules are made, called LX Navigation, which are huge in the glider industry but unknown everywhere else. And they've produced a combination instrument which is both analogue and digital. And the digital readout is really large. The letters are over half inch high. So people that would normally need reading glasses to view the instrument panel on an aircraft can actually see it and read it without the need to swap their sunglasses for reading glasses. So it's been really well accepted. Does the airplane have a parachute? It does. It comes as standard. Uh, made by the GRS company, they claim a minimum save height of 200 feet. So it's a very, very fast deployment and activation parachute. We're now looking at a, an eight or nine year repack cycle. Previously it used to be six years and that was always a concern that we'd have to send it back to the factory after six years. Well that's now extended to nine and they've simplified the installation now so we can do a hot swap in the US. Pipistrel's been around now for a while. Overall with the line are you finding good acceptance in the US market? Yes, it's taken a little while because originally we didn't qualify for the LSA category. It's all to do with bilateral agreements. Yugoslavia, which is part of what was Slovenia years ago, had a bilateral agreement with the USA. When the country broke up into different subcategories like uh, Croatia, Serbia, uh, Slovenia and, and others, um, those uh, bilaterals ceased to exist. We first of all said, OK, well, let's just get another bilateral. And after three years of many sort of uh, phone calls and letters and diplomatic, it's a diplomatic process rather than an airworthiness process, we decided that was too hard. And so for those three or four years, we we're only selling aircraft in the experimental category and as kits. So then we decided, OK, we're missing out on the LSA category. So Pipistrel only 10 miles from Italy. They already owned an airfield right on the border in Italy where they had, they had some buildings I was just using for storage. So they uh, cleaned those out and uh, started a production facility uh, in Italy and all of the uh, LSA aircraft for the, for the uh, US market are made in Italy. Everything else is made in the main, fa main factory in Slovenia. Michael Coates of Pipistrel Aircraft, thanks very much for talking with us today on Aero TV. My pleasure, thank you. Have a great day.